Welcome to the 2020 Awards Podcast. Today we've asked our guest screenwriter George Wing to share what he believes is an example of a great screenplay. I was quite surprised when George suggested the French film Diva from 1981, written by director Jean-Jacques Binier. I nice. think that's how you say it. And nice. Jean Van Ham, not to be confused <laughs> with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Let's, let's take a listen to a scene. Motorcycle. Today we're joined by screenwriter George Wing, who wrote the Adam Sandler film, 51st Dates, and the indie film Outsourced, which went on to spawn the NBC comedy of the same name. He was also the writer on that. Is that right? Is that right? I wrote the pilot. You wrote the NBC pilot. Show. Okay, that's what I thought. With, okay. with my partner, John Jeffcoat. Correct. Thank you for including John in there. Uh, or Jeff John Cote, as I always mistakenly call him. Uh, anyway, welcome back to the show, George. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so, Diva is a French thriller about a young postman obsessed with an opera singer who has never recorded any of her performances. The postman makes a bootleg recording of her performance and becomes the recipient of another recording, a prostitute's confession indicting the chief of police as the head of a prostitution ring. The postman is pursued by good cops, bad cops, and also a couple of Taiwanese gangsters wanting to release the recording of the opera singers. Uh, the question is, who will get to the postman first? So, uh, George, I have to say, I was really surprised that this was your pick. What is it about Diva that, that, that sparks your interest? Well, it's just one of my all-time favorite movies. You asked me to talk about a movie that was more than 20 years old, and I was... 14 when I saw this, and I, I think it made me want to get into the movie business. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I ran out and bought a moped after I saw this movie, because <laughs> all the characters ride mopeds. Yeah. Um, it made me really want to live in a huge loft full of junk someday. Sure, and I, yeah. I, I eventually achieved that goal wow. in, in New York City, um, and thought I was really cool for living in a loft. Um, it even taught me that you can wear your scuba mask and snorkel when you cut onions, which I that was I clever. Did. That yes. was a good tip. <laughs> Martha Stewart never taught us that. Oh, you know what? I, I did not. I, I didn't put that together. That that's what was going on. I just thought it was another wacky, obscure French. Oh moment. no! I never put it together that he's cutting <laughs> onions. Yes, indeed. But um, yeah, I, this is not the kind of movie I normally care most about because. Well, it's the whole style versus substance question. Yeah. There's a lot of style in this yep. movie. And for me, somehow this works. Um, the, there's quite a lot of plot, too. I mean, there's certainly a whole thriller oh, yeah, story yeah, going yeah. on here. That's not the part I like the most. The part I like the most is the philosopher character, Goro Dish, and his weird Vietnamese girlfriend, Alba. And they don't appear to be crucial to the plot early on, but then they, they become drawn into it. And to me, that was just the the images that are burned into my mind is Guru Dish sitting uh, sitting next to a pile of um, empty Gitan cigarette boxes, which happen to be the same blue and white color as the giant cr uh, jigsaw puzzle of a wave that he's yeah, yeah. putting together. Yeah. Somehow he knows everything that's happening in Paris, even though he never leaves this incredibly darkened <laughs> loft. <laughs> it's, it's over the top. It's silly. Yeah. But I just at, at, at 14, I just thought this was the coolest thing ever. And having recently reviewed it, I still feel that way. Maybe it's because it's just burned into my brain. Um, the soundtrack definitely mm -hmm. calls attention to itself. Yeah. Um, not trying to be naturalistic. The reason it's not all flash and no substance for me is that I think that emotionally... The, the main character, who is the postman, um, who is completely obsessed with this opera singer, is absolutely the core of the movie. His, his passion for opera, and first of all, and then for her. Um, it somehow, it's not a bag of money that there is, that is the MacGuffin right. that's being yeah. traded around. Yeah. It's basically her soul. Yeah. It's her soul, because she believes that if she commits her voice to magnetic tape, something is taken from her. Right. And he took it from her, and that's his secret. And so they're running around Paris, basically 
everyone wants this piece of her soul. And, and if, it, if it is taken from her, she will lose something forever. Right. Well, not everyone wants it. Just the, uh, but I thought they were Vietnamese. They're Taiwanese because Taiwan had no copyright agreement. So they, oh, could, okay. they could pirate it legally or they could get away with it. But what I didn't get was why they couldn't just record their own version instead of having to track down this kid. I thought about that, too. I think it was because he was a postman, so he had the mail bag, which allowed him to smuggle the Nagra into the right. performance. A Nagra but, at the time was... Oh, because he did put his hat on, so he'd be obviously yes. a postman. That's right. That was at, it. at that time, the only high-quality audio equipment would be as big as a briefcase, and it would draw attention to you if you tried to smuggle it into oh, a okay. concert like this. Sure. That's my theory. But, first of all, he's got it in a briefcase, so... The whole premise of like the recording being of high quality is ridiculous. There's actually no microphone. There's no microphone. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's part of it. But also, I don't understand. Are the like are the Taiwanese guys? They just happen to be sitting behind yes. them, and they're like, "Oh my god, this guy's got the thing we've been wanting." Yep, they happen to be sitting behind him, and one leans yeah, okay. over and whispers to the other, and <laughs> they happen to be wearing their sunglasses right, to the right, opera. Right. Yeah, how did those guys get around? <laughs> Because I've never, you never see them during the day. Yeah. It's like, they must not be able to see anything. Well, they had the first cell phone ever, ever sold. <laughs> the they cell made, phone or they had they the car made phone? The, they had the car phone. Yeah, yes. the car the phone. Car yeah. Phone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's stuff like that, 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 again, well, I did see this when it came out in the theater back in 81 and, and, and seeing it again the other day, I think I've seen it once since then, um, but seeing it again the other day. I was just blown away at how much visually this film, similar to you, had influenced like where I was at that time. Especially when I went to film school, I, I realized like, oh my god, like I made this film about an artist, and you know, and 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 he lived in this giant loft space that was like this, you know. I mean, it was like I was basically trying to remake that movie, and hmm. and uh, I even noticed like I have a pair of pants that look like his pants that I was like, Oh my God, I'm still like trying to look like this movie. Um, but, but the film really has not stuck with me. And I think the main reason for that is basically the last act. Our, our protagonist kind of disappears from the film. Like the postman basically becomes, uh, taken over by, by the, the yeah, yes. yeah, and and it, then it's his movie. Suddenly. That's true. And then you know, and and our postman is just lying dormant for pretty much the whole end of the film up until the very last moment, which I actually loved. The very final scene between him and and uh, the opera singer, where he reveals that he's the one who has the tape. It's wonderful. Yeah. And well, she gets to hear herself for the first time. She gets she's to hear herself. herself. Yeah. And, and 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 it is. It's the moment where you're kind of going like, all right, well, we know he's gonna at some point fess up to this he's 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 in love with her she has feelings for feelings him. for him and uh and so it's like all right well now how is this going to play out and it's really wonderful she walks into the opera hall kind of i guess thinking about like knowing that this tape exists and that she, her her soul is is now out there for anyone to have and then he reveals to her that he's the one with the tape by playing it for her. And so she gets to hear herself for the first time. She's kind of stunned and you're still not sure how they're going to, how she's going to respond to it. And he comes up on stage and stands next to her and she takes his hand and that's how the movie ends. And it's really, really beautiful visual storytelling. And I always a huge fan of anything where you can show it instead of say it. And so like, mm -hmm. to me that it's, it's a wonderful ending and it kind of redeems Whatever I was feeling a loss of for that last half hour, but um. it's true that you should never take the, the climax of a movie away from your protagonist. And in this movie, the, the postman does take second fiddle to Gorodish, the yeah. philosopher. Who, but Gorodish in the finale, he's just wrapping up the gangster plot. It it, it is the postman mm -hmm. who wraps up the moral wrong that's been done. Yeah. And, well, then and Gordon the did get end. rid of the Taiwanese guys. He had a big elaborate plan to get those guys murdered. True. Yes. So he kind of wrapped them both up. Uh, the criminal element yes. of both. Well, yeah, the criminal element. Yeah, yeah. Not the emotional element. Right. But another reason it's that Gordish may have taken over the movie at a certain point is that this was based on a book 
um, by a French writer who goes by the pen name of De La Corta. Mm-hmm. And he wrote a whole series of these books. And they were not about the postman. They were about Gorodish and Alba. Oh, his, okay. It's an unconsummated relationship with his little tiny Vietnamese girlfriend. Right, so yeah. there's a whole bunch of these books out there, and the French public I'm knows... I'm glad to hear them consummated. <laughs> <laughs> well, they slept in different, uh, different beds or different uh, hammocks. Yes, right. Hammocks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's a, there's a character that's well-known to the French reading public of Gorodish, more so than the postman. Um, yeah, there's kind of a... For a sexy thriller, it's kind of sexless, actually. There's not much going on in that department. Yeah. Uh, except that the postman who steals the gown of the opera singer does, at a certain point in the movie, um, hire a prostitute who looks just like her to wear it. Yeah. But we don't see what happens next. Right. We right, just see right. her putting on the gown. Yeah. Um, that probably would never happen in an American movie where you're supposed to like the guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but then he not. gives the gown back after it's been worn by a prostitute. Yeah, you know, that's sort of, I thought about that, did he? Yeah. he Take it to the dry cleaners? I don't think he did. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> he also wore it on his moped as a scarf. Yeah. Yes, that, that like, was not clean by the time it got no. back. No. Well, that brings up the question of adaptation. So, does it mean, do you think it's the responsibility to stay true to the material or to adapt it and just say, like, all right, here's the basic concept, well, now we're going to... Uh, no, I think your responsibility is to make a great movie. Yeah, I mean, I just I just pitched a studio on an adaptation of a book, and I threw away a lot of the book in service of keeping the story moving. And yeah, they had no problems whatsoever with that. Um, well, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I think yeah. I mean, to me, that was that's the only thing I could think of, like why that it didn't stick with me. Because visually, it's it's a fantastic film. And 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 I remember, I remember little beats throughout the film. I remember the climax where they, you know, they hang the uh, the light switch. They move the light switch mm-hmm. out over the elevator opening, and the and the guy's reaching for it, and of course falls into the. That elevator. was clever. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. And uh, and even the big moment where where the prostitute comes up and puts the uh, tape in the postman's bag. I remember all of that stuff, and it's, it is really well done. It's all visually well told it's just i think there's something for me that just kind of left me like how come i don't remember anything else about this movie like i just remember little beats and moments i remember you know what's his name dominique pignon oh yes as the assassin who doesn't like anything doesn't like anything and what's up with that so he doesn't like anything does that have any significance or is that just the it's just funny, funny. It's, yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of sly humor in this actually yeah he says je n'aime pas les garages i don't like parking garages and then mm-hmm. um finally his partner says you don't like anything he's sort of the one actor who we've seen in other movies when it, as i yeah. reviewed this i realized most of these french actors this didn't launch their careers yeah this is the one place we've seen them but he, he's been in a bunch of jean-pierre Jeunet movies yeah delicatessen what was he I guess listening so. to the whole time polka music really yeah at the end that I, was the yeah. big that was the was big he, reveal like he, <laughs> lost, he hates everything but polka yeah. apparently <laughs> Yeah, it's very funny. It's like I, because <laughs> I, I, I remember the first time I saw it. I, like, what the hell is in his like, ear? What's, what's he constantly? Because he's and he's not just listening. He's always putting his hand up to the earbud like he's getting instructions or something. Right? Like yes, that. yes. It's like, like so a secret you think like guy. yeah, like a secret service guy, and then you find out it's like he's just no, listening to his iPod. He's just yeah, exactly. But he's a good example of how Walkman. In this movie, the whole cops and robbers and thriller plot is constantly undermined by humor. Like when the police chief sits on this whoopee cushion, like oh, right. greeting card on a desk, yeah. and yeah. the uh, one policeman is always bragging about how strong his thighs are and how he's a great runner and yeah. <laughs> yeah. hitting on his female partner. Yeah. So the the thriller part doesn't take itself too seriously, but the romance part does, and the the sort of love of opera takes mm-hmm. itself very seriously. And this is one of those rare movies where the MacGuffin is supposed to be this incredibly valuable thing, and therefore. Her performance of this one aria from an opera called La Wallie has to be has to be fantastic for the movie to work, and it is. It's just yeah. absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. It's wonderful, and she's gorgeous. And the producers were very lucky to have found her, because the book called for a beautiful black American opera diva who also spoke French, <laughs> and they found one. Yeah, and this is her she only film me. role, Wilhelmina Fernandez. Yeah, her only film role. She did La Bohème on television. Oh, okay. She was okay, pretty good. 
I mean, her French is, sounds like an American, but if that's, that's, that's I mean, how okay. it should be. You know, watching it, I guess that she was primarily an opera singer first and an actress second. Yes. But that said, I mean, she's she is the MacGuffin, really, as you said, and she's there to kind of kickstart the story and and you know she's there to sing basically so i thought she did fine i wasn't like oh my god why couldn't they get a better actress you know mm-hmm. it's like she's kind of served her purpose so all right all right speaking of serving our purpose <laughs> honesty nature made it right we put it in a bottle refreshingly honest honesty visit honesty.com to find a distributor near you and our other sponsor today is Hilliard's Beer, brewed and canned in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood, but drunk everywhere. Visit their tap room Thursday through Sunday. You can get more info on them at hilliardsbeer.com. I love um, a chase scene in a movie, but this one where the police officer with his great thighs was, was running on foot after a moped. Yes. Seemed ridiculous. Especially. And he was, he was, he was always so close. Especially given that this moped was supposedly the fastest moped out there. <laughs> All right. Remember, this is the fancy racing moped. Right, well, right. but still, it's only like maybe 40 miles an hour. <laughs> right. But the guy can maybe run, what, six miles an hour at the most? Yeah. That was a, it's, it's a famous chase scene in, in cinema, though, and it's really fun to watch. It is. That brings me back to the whole style versus substance thing. Yeah. I think that substance should always come first, but if you do the style really, really well, like I, I believe it is done in this movie, mm-hmm. I think it's okay. Um, it, but, well, I, th- I, I, I think most movies prove your point. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of films that are are remembered for you know their style and uh, and get probably a lot more credit than they're due because I think they're very stylish, but they have little to say and and offer us besides style. And I think the '80s were kind of like the pinnacle of that. Mm. Well, I don't know if they were the pinnacle, but it's kind of where it all kind of started, I think. There's some just purely stylistic flourishes in this that don't need to be in the movie. Like when they need to go hide out, they hide out in this insanely phallic lighthouse that is <laughs> right. owned by the, the philosopher guy who's also a millionaire. Right. And it has several Bentleys. But they needed to get them near the, near the ocean. Yes. Because that was a big theme in the Always he as soon as he finished his puzzle he could leave the loft. That was the first time he left the loft, right? As soon as his puzzle was complete. I was not aware he of that. Was, it Good seemed, point. Yeah. Yeah, he was able to get back into life. Ah. Okay. But nothing really happens in that lighthouse scene. They have no. breakfast. <laughs> no, nothing really happens in a lot of a lot of the scenes. I but think. there's a lot of gorgeous it's just beautiful. You just want to be in that lighthouse. Oh, well, it, you know, the photos of that Rolls Royce or the, the cinematography around that Rolls Royce and the way it like there's a great shot where it's like, you know, the the phallic <laughs> lighthouse is on a, the left hand of the screen and then the Rolls Royce drives away from it. And it's it's shot in a way that uh, the wheels are kind of cropped. So it looks like it's just gliding across oh, yes. the bottom of the screen. Well, that's a Citroën, actually. The Rolls Royce oh. is one of the one of the junk cars in his loft. Is a Rolls Royce. Oh, I thought that the was white a car Rolls. is a Citroen. Yeah. Is it? Yep. Oh. Come on, Chris. <laughs> oh Sorry. man. Minor point. Yeah. Actually, the, mo- the single most ridiculous thing in the movie is that there are two vintage white Citroens. Oh, I know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Owned by the guy. There's one up, and then he like goes over to the garage and like opens the door. And there's, yes. There's another one right there waiting for him. And yet, when I was 14, I thought that was super cool. Of course, yeah. Of course, he had the backup Citroen. Right. Of course. <laughs> well, this guy all of a sudden seems to be ready for everything. Like, you know I'll that, take care of it. That yeah. piece of. Sh- Vintage Volvo that I drive. I've got two of them. <laughs> Is that a fact? Yeah, <laughs> one in the underground. I'm sure you could get another one too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they both have a muffler hanging on with a coat hanger and a piece of the Well, you know, missing. when something goes down, you need to blow up some Taiwanese bootleggers, and one you'll <laughs> yeah. have a backup. That's right. And that's important. That's it's really important it, to be prepared. That's I what I've been waiting. You probably for. learned that in Boy Scouts. Yeah. Um. One of the things that the movie did do is going back to the plot and the chases and stuff like that. I've noticed because trying to construct some of my own stories, it's like I've noticed like, oh, it's always nice to have three pursuants going after the same thing. And they did again. I mentioned Midnight Run on an earlier podcast, but Mm. same thing. You've got the good cops. You've got the bad cops. You've got the gangsters. They're all they had. They're not all looking for the same thing, but they're all looking for the same person. And Midnight Run, you had the. The FBI, you had the gangster or the the mob, and you had like an additional bounty hunter trying to get all. And it's like it's almost nice because like every time you think 
it's a nice device in the way that every time you think there's going to be like a little breathing room that suddenly, you know, in swoops the next yes. team of pursuance. Well, yeah, it's it great. He well. didn't know who was after him for what reason either. Right. Yeah. He thought it was at first because he stole the dress. Sure. We've mm-hmm. got three pursuers and actually two MacGuffins. Or Midnight Ryan only had one, which was the guy, Charles Grodin. Right. But here we've got two audio tapes. And yeah, they, the characters slowly figure it out as it goes along. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know everything from the start. Because we see it all. It, this movie has a lot of plot. Actually, it's pretty oh, yeah, tightly it's, plotted. Yeah, but yeah. to me, it's not even about that. I could even do without the whole corrupt police plot. Oh, right. it seems I mean, totally arbitrary. Yeah, but that keeps the, that got that movie made, right? Yeah. But the real soul of this movie is this is this romance between this postman who loves this opera singer. Yeah. And the the strange twists and turns that that takes. Yeah. And uh, he's a creepy stalker, really. That's what oh, he is. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And but then he reveals himself to be that to her, and she, when she learns that he rode his moped from Paris to Munich, probably in the rain, <laughs> right, just to see one of her performances, then she feels like she's connecting with her true audience, and she surprisingly accepts him and invites him into very intimate scenarios. Like he's the first person who ever gets to listen to her rehearse. Right. And as soon as she says that she'll let him do that, he asks if he can take a bath while listening to her. Right. <laughs> kind of creepy, right? But it, it's kind somehow... Of? <laughs> also, I mean, he hasn't probably bathed in quite a while. He's been busy, been busy being chased. Yeah. That too. And yes, it's another unconsummated relationship, certainly, even though they're often lounging around in her hotel room in bathrobes. Right. It's... It's not sexual between them, although he would probably want that given his little... I got the impression they did sleep together. No, he wakes up on a couch in the morning covered in a light blue blanket, which is her signature color. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Who knows? There's a lot of sexual tension in the film from everybody. Well, you know, you've got Gordadish and and, uh, and his Vietnamese concubine. (laughs) Right, who starts? You know. She starts dating the postman early in the movie, and you right. think that's going to be an issue. Right, it isn't really. He sort of scolds her, yeah. tells her he's going to kick her out if she comes home too late. But it's yeah. it's not about that. He's he's Gorodish, the philosopher, is very excited that his girlfriend has brought home this kid in trouble. Right, gives him something to do. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and he himself is an is an opera fan. Yeah, have you read any of the books? I haven't. Uh, looking at this movie again makes me want to go read some of them. I don't know if they've all been translated to English. I think it's a very French thing. Yeah. I'd be curious to know what what their other adventures are like. Yeah, or why the other books haven't been made into movies. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Is this something you wish you had written? You know, I, w- I, wouldn't, I wouldn't write half of this movie. Yeah. I wouldn't write the thriller part. Uh, and the romance part is not a romantic comedy. Um it is the undercurrent of comedy throughout that sort of makes this movie work for me. If it took itself too seriously, I think it would be pretentious garbage. It would be ridiculous. <laughs> I, I guess that's the difference. Yeah. If the humor works, it's not pretentious garbage. <laughs> I, I recently saw um, Upstream Color, which would be an utterly unbearable, pretentious art film if it weren't just so brilliant. It's actually not funny at all, but... Have you seen that? No. Completely what is brilliant. it? It is the new movie by the guy who made Primer, which was a big hit at oh, right. Sundance yeah. nine years ago. And it's completely incomprehensible. You walk out having understood only about half of what you just saw. Yeah. It makes you want to go back and see it again. I highly recommend it. But Sounds it. like Primer. <laughs> this is better than Primer. Primer just left me bewildered. Yeah. But this is uh, one of the creepiest movies I've ever seen. Oh, really? And it, it just, I can't get it out of my head. Oh. Yeah. Off topic, but yeah. see Upstream Color. All right. It probably won't win any awards. It, it, it probably deserves some. But we'll talk about that in a future podcast. In a future podcast. I was going to ask, what is this movie about? Because I really didn't have any clue. But I think, I think you hit it, like the first thing you said, is like about her soul. One of the hardest things to do when making a movie work on paper is to get people behind the protagonist. And the way you get people behind the main character is you feel their longing, whatever their longing is. Uh, once we get a palpable sense of that, very often it's a longing for another person or another state of being. Um, but in this movie, uh, they get it done in the first scene. You see this amazing opera performance. You cut to a guy in the audience who's just 
gazing at this singer with a look that just makes you feel that, that you know she's everything to him and that gets taken care of right off the top and then the movie works from then um what does it all mean what's the theme of it i don't know it could be a purity of passion or something about art transcending everything else in life probably the latter it's what? French. It could be anything. <laughs> I'm sure it's. I'm sure it's that because it's French. It sounds like something. Um, There's this really gritty, awful plot about prostitutes being traded for drugs, and there's a lot of people being killed, and that's absolutely the ugliest side of human interactions. And then there's this gorgeous art form, which most of us know nothing about, which is opera, and specifically uh, the singing of an aria by a soloist, and that it's all those two things shouldn't work together very well in the same movie. And in this case, uh, Jean-Jacques Benet wove them together beautifully. There's something else I want to say about this movie uh, for its 25th anniversary. It was screened at the Seattle film festival and the director came here oh. for the screening yeah. and I was in the audience and he gave an effusive thank you to Seattle because apparently the success of it in Seattle made this movie work around the world. It was panned, in France, the critics hated it. Oh, was it, it really? Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. The critics hated it. The audience thought it was laughable and ridiculous. Kind of, like, I think, I believe Casablanca had an initial reaction like that, too. It, it finally got some U.S. distribution, and it came to some theater in Seattle, I forget which one, where it just played and played and played, and audiences kept showing up, and that turned the movie around for global audiences, and it, it, it took off from there. Another movie that uh, Seattle did that for was The Stuntman. Yes. Yeah. It played for over a year somewhere. Yeah. Do you remember which theater? I think it was, uh, was it the Guild 45th? Probably something <clears> like that. Can yeah. you imagine a movie playing for a year at a theater these days? No. <laughs> well, I guess back then you didn't have VHS. And yeah, I mean, back, I mean, back then. I mean, it makes right, sense. Right. I mean, right. and, and, and that was not uncommon. We had one little theater in the in the town I grew up in, and... There was, I mean, stuff would play there all year long. So we're an incredible movie-loving town, and we sometimes just the way they sometimes try out Broadway shows here, and we make them successes. We sometimes sometimes do that for movies, and yeah. Diva is one example of that. This seems like a movie Seattle would get behind. Sure, what well, did? Yeah, um, but and as for the director's career since Diva, this was his first film. He also made Betty Blue, mm -hmm. which was his other big hit. And then other some other movies that have not not been so well received. Did he do uh, was it the bear? Something about a bear. He made a movie called Rosalie and the Lions, which was a circus film, which absolutely no one saw. I liked it a lot actually. And I think he makes documentaries now. You know what would be a really cool TV show is give Gorodish the philosopher his own show where he just solves stuff like this in his own funky <laughs> French way. Wouldn't that be w worth watching? <laughs> Come on. It's good. He's a good recurring character. He and his Alba, his little girlfriend. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd watch that show. I would watch that. Yeah. It's going to be like a procedural. <laughs> Absolutely. He, he, he I don't somehow, know if like, he doesn't. It's a French yeah. procedural, though. So there'd, you be, can really, there'd be no it. procedure. You can Americanize <laughs> it. He can be living in New York with. You'd have to age Alba a little bit. At least 20. <laughs> <laughs> George's at like, least no. 20. All right, I'm going to go pitch this to someone. She can still right. look young, but she has to be at least 20. Every week he works on a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> and it helps him think. And, and so whenever like there's a mystery going on and he can't quite figure it out, he while he's literally putting the last piece of the puzzle in, he figures it out. Perfect. And on that note, <laughs> thanks for joining us, George. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, George. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Honest Tea and Hilliard's Beer. If you're a movie lover and would like to support us, you can subscribe to the 2020 Film Club. Your annual subscription gets you into 10 of our monthly four-year consideration screenings here in Seattle, plus a ticket to our annual ceremony in February. It's over a $100 value for only $40 to enroll. Just visit us at 2020awards.org and look for the subscriber link. Uh, until next time, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past.